you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Leviticus 23. My goal is to wrap up the Feast of Booths today, so I'm going to be hitting things fairly quickly. Uh, as with all my messages, if you would like, after we're done, uh, let me know and I'll give you a copy of my notes. That way, if you missed anything, you can kind of catch it up uh, in the notes. Um, we are to the last of the dedicated feasts that God called and established, ordained for Israel. We have covered the spring feasts. Uh, we've covered two of the fall feasts. Um, we are on the last one uh, for the calendar year of Israel. This is the last feast. So in Leviticus 23, we're going to read from 33 to the end. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the people of Israel saying, On the fifteenth day of this month, and for seven days is the feast of booths to the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. For seven days you shall present food offerings to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall hold a holy convocation and present a food offering to the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. You shall not do any ordinary work. These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim at times of holy, as times of holy convocation for presenting to the Lord food offerings, burnt offerings, and grain offerings, sacrifices and drink offerings, each on its proper day. Besides the Lord's Sabbath, and besides your gifts, and beside all your vow offerings, and besides all of your free will offerings, which you give to the Lord. On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn rest, and on the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of the splendid tree, branches of the palm trees, and boughs of the leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. You shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Thus Moses declared to the people of Israel the appointed feasts of the Lord. Now, we have covered a number of different passages that deal with the actual uh, feast. Uh, we've, we've drawn out a number of, of things as to how they were to celebrate. Um, that I want to start a, a little bit of a new section today. We've gone through all of the law explaining how this is to be done. Uh, we've looked at the passages as to what the offerings were. Uh, I want to touch on that real quick today because there, there's a few things in the process that you really need to fix your minds on, okay? Because they bear a direct relationship to some things that are going on in the New Testament. Uh, one of the things with the offering uh, that they would do is that they would offer each day, in addition to the regular offering, um, they would do two rams each day, 98 male lambs, which is 14 each day, and then 70 bulls. And they would start with 13 on the first day and then reduce by one each of the seven days. So that at the end of the feast, they would have sacrificed 70 bulls. You go, okay, so what? Why do I care about all the animals? You have to understand that nothing is without meaning in the Jews, okay, to the Jewish thinking. Seventy is a specific number for them. In the book of Genesis, it lists out the 70 tribes of Gentiles. So 70 to the Jewish mind, when you use the number 70, you're telling them the world, the Gentiles, not Israel, okay? When a Jew sees the number 70, especially in Scripture in relation to the law or the prophets or the writings, their mind immediately clicks to, okay, the Gentiles, okay, the 70 nations out of Genesis. Um, kind of a correlation to that is in the New Testament when Jesus is uh, feeding the 5,000, okay, uh, 5,000 to the Jewish mind, 
the root number five represents the law, the Torah. And so that's for the Jewish people. It's what makes them a unique people in all of the earth. Okay? But when Jesus went across the lake to the other side, and, and he was in the land of the Gentiles, how many did he feed? He did 5,000 and then 4,000. 4,000 to the Jewish way of thinking is the four corners of the earth. That's the world. That's the people. Um, when you look at what was given, the, the loaves and the fish, if you watch the numbers, each of those numbers has a significance to the Jewish thinking. We don't operate that way. As a result, when a lot of things are written out in Scripture, because we don't think like that, we miss something that to a Jew is very obvious. Okay? So when they're talking about 70 bulls, it's as much as saying these are the sacrifices for the world. Okay? So, something to kind of key on. Again, I can't stress to you enough, there is nothing in Scripture that's there on accident. Okay? So, we're going to jump to the writings. We're, we're stepping out of the law. We've wrapped up the law. Uh, in the writings, I'm just going to go through the, the passages. I'm not going to read them because there's a lot of verses to cover. I would encourage you, take all of these passages home, read them for yourself, investigate for yourself. Don't trust me to get everything covered. Okay? You guys study. Develop your own insight. See what's going on in the Word. Invest yourself in the Word. Okay? So the first passage, 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 1 through 66. It's the entire chapter. This is the dedication of the temple by Solomon. Okay? And if you remember, uh, they had so many sacrifices that they couldn't keep count of them. Uh, as a matter of fact, the altar was not of sufficient size to hold all the sacrifice, so they had to do it uh, in another place in the courtyard. Um, the, the, the temple, which had taken years to be built, which was promised to David that his son would build it, is complete. And so they, they bring in, they celebrate. Everything has been ordained. Everything has been made holy. And then Solomon prays over the temple, and he prays over the people. And one of the things that I find very interesting, uh, Solomon was a very smart person. Okay? Um, I, I think maybe sometimes that wisdom got him into trouble because Solomon knew how to work alliances with people and, and make peace with nations. But as part of that, uh, he brought in people into his household that drew him away from God. Uh, if you look on a map, uh, you have the city of David, which sits right below the Temple Mount. Okay, And then you have the Mount of Olives, just south of the Mount of Olives, is a, a hill that is called the Mount of Offense. Okay, it was on that hill, that mountain, that Solomon built all the temples to the other gods for his wives. Okay, and it sits directly across from the city of David. But one of the things that David or that Solomon did when he was praying was he said, God, when your people turn away from you. And he lists all of these things that will happen when they turn away from him. He lists the, the drought and, and the, the enemies that come against him and the wild animals that come against him. But he ends each one of these phrases by saying, and when they turn their face to you, and this temple, okay, why was the temple important? Why, why did they have to look toward the temple? Because that was the dwelling place of God. That's where God resided on earth. Okay? And, and he said, when they repent and they turn away from their sin, even if they're in a foreign land, that you have sent them to as punishment. When they turn to you and repent and, and look to this land and they ask for your forgiveness, Father, remember and forgive them. God, forgive them. Okay? Solomon knew what was coming. He knew the nature of people. He didn't need to go far back into the history of Israel to find out how willfully <coughs> sinful they were. Okay? So um, he sets up this temple and then they celebrate the establishment of the temple for seven days. Okay? And then they celebrate an additional seven days. Now hold those things in your thought because we're going to touch on that again in Chronicles because Chronicles is going to retell this story with a little bit of a different angle. Okay? So keep that in mind. Seven days, seven days, and then another day. Okay? 
1 Kings 12, 25 through 33, uh, the kingdom has been split because of Solomon. Uh, the ten tribes in the north split off and they anointed Jeroboam as their king. Rehoboam kept Judah and Benjamin in the south. And Jeroboam, God told him, hey, I'm going to take these people away from, from Solomon and I'm going to give some of them to you. But for the sake of David, I'm going to leave Judah alone. They're going to stay with David. And, and Jeroboam, he, he uh, finds out that Solomon died. He comes back from Egypt and he says, hey, look, you got to make things right here. We were suffering under your father. Make things right. And Rehoboam, he talks to the counselors of his father and they say, yeah, man, let up. If you will let up, you will have these people's hearts forever. And then he talks to his friends. Isn't it amazing how when we want an opinion, we always go to somebody that's going to give us our opinion? <laughs> and, and they tell them, hey, man, you've got to keep these people in line. You've got to show them who's boss. You've got to tell them, man, you're a bigger man than your dad ever was. And God split the nation. Okay. Now Jeroboam takes the ten tribes in the north where God, God gives them to him. But then he sees... Three times a year, all of the men are going to Jerusalem. They're coming out of the kingdom of North Ephraim or, or Israel, and they're heading to Judah to worship. He goes, hmm, this does not bode well for my kingdom because three times a year they have to go to Rehoboam and to the temple. And he says, it's not going to take long until they, th they say, why are we even separated? Let's join back together. And, and so what does he do? He, he creates a counterfeit. What's interesting is that he creates a counterfeit celebration on the same day of the following month of the Feast of Tabernacles. And then he appoints priests, he builds golden calves and idols, and he says, hey, 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 why are you going all the way to Jerusalem? Man, it's a long trek. There's, there's, there's desert, there's wilderness, it's, it's tough. We got gods here. You know what? We got gods not only here, but we also got them over there, so you don't have to go as far. And then he, he anoints priests, anyone that he would, so that the people didn't have to go to Jerusalem. Now that was bad news. Because he did that, God took the kingdom away and God expunged his family from the face of the earth. But it's interesting to note the date that he chose is exactly one month after the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay? That's the day that they celebrated their gods. One month after. So we have the Jewish calendar that, that wraps up the religious festivals, the feasts uh, with the, the Feast of Tabernacles. And then he goes a little bit further and says, hey, look, look, you know, hey, we can have the celebration here. Satan is a counterfeiter. Okay? He wants to do things that make him look like God, but they have nothing to do with God. Keep your eyes peeled in this life. That's why we're called to be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves. We're not called to operate in ignorance and stupidity. We're called to act in wisdom. Okay? The enemy, he goes about as an angel of light. He tries to deceive. He wants to counterfeit what God has done. Okay? One of these days I'll get into a series on, on the workings of that because we see it throughout Scripture, how he counterfeits God. So we see that Jeroboam establishes a new feast for the ten tribes in the north. Um, 2 Chronicles 7, 8 through 10. Now, in this passage, we see the reiteration of the dedication of the feast. One of the things that we draw out is that when Solomon dedicated the, the temple, he took seven days for them to celebrate, and then he did an additional seven days. Well, if you look at the month that this happened, that second seven days is the Feast of Tabernacles. So he did the seven days prior to... And then he got to the 15th of the month and he did an additional seven days. And then if you look, it says this really interesting comment. On the eighth day, he told them to rest. Remember, according to the rule, according to the law, the first day is a solemn occasion. You do no regular work. Then you celebrate. You will. You have to rejoice. By golly. <laughs> have fun. And then you get to the seventh day, and then there's an added eighth day, which God calls to be similar to the first day, a holy convocation. You shall do no ordinary work. Okay? That's the week of the Feast of Tabernacles. 
Basically, they, they tagged on the dedication of the temple to the beginning, and they went straight from that into celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay? Now, there's two other places in the uh, Hebrew Scriptures that we see the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles, and they kind of go hand in glove. Uh, the first one is Ezra chapter 3, verse 4. Um, now, if you remember, this is after the uh, exile. Ezra was a priest that came back to Israel under Cyrus. Um, he was the one that read the law. But one of the things that it says is just this little, little verse that's stuck in there. Uh, it says that they celebrated anew the, the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, we understand from his writing that the Feast of Tabernacles was not celebrated while Israel was in exile. Okay? So they come back to Israel, and, and you've got to remember that it was totaled. They cast down the walls of Jerusalem. Um, they, they imported a bunch of people from all over the land, and they integrated, and they married, and that became the Samaritans. Uh, so when the, the Jews come back, they find not only has the land been destroyed, but the people are destroyed as well. Okay? The Jews that stayed there were, were not faithful to the covenant. They were not faithful to the law, and they intermarried with other people. They became the, the half-castes, the, the, the ones that the Samaritans. How could you give up what God has given you to take on your, your, the, the pagan and, and the Gentile? So we have this little thing in there. But then Nehemiah, who is the cupbearer for King Cyrus, um, he comes and he's actually appointed the governor of uh, Israel, and in Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 13 through 18, we see some interesting things. Uh, let's go ahead and turn there real quick. I, I want to hit this. Um, I want to read this for you because I want to draw out a couple things. <clears throat> so Nehemiah chapter 8. We're going to pick up in verse 13. Okay? So, Nehemiah has called Ezra into the temple grounds. He's called him to read the law that the people would know exactly what God expected of them. And then in verse 13, it says, On the second day, the heads of the fathers' houses of all the people with the priests and the Levites came together to Ezra, the scribe, in order to study the words of the law. And they found it written in the law that the Lord had commanded by Moses that the people of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month. Okay? So we know that would be the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. Verse 15. And that they should proclaim it and publish it in all their towns and in Jerusalem. Go out to the hills and bring branches of olive, wild olive, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees to make booths as it is written. So the people went out and brought them and made booths for themselves, each on his roof and in their courts and in the courts of the uh, house of God and in the square at the water gate and in the square at the gate of Ephraim. And all the assembly, uh, and all the assembly of those who had returned from captivity made booths and lived in the booths. For from the days of Joshua the son of Nun to the day that the people of Israel, uh, to that day the people of Israel had not done so. And there was a very great rejoicing. And day by day, from the first day to the last day, he read from the book of the law. They kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to the rule. Okay, so a couple things I want to draw out from this passage. Okay, we see that they are resuming the Feast of Tabernacles in Israel. We see that they had come together, that they would hear the law. We talked about how every seventh year... Uh, at the Feast of Tabernacles, every seventh time they would read the law so that anybody that had come into the land or anybody that was born in the, the previous seven years would hear the law and they would know the law. So we see that they're picking up right here on a Sabbath festival, the seventh year of the, the Feast of Tabernacles. The proclamation went out. Uh, you see that they gathered in the branches, the olive branch, the wild olive, the myrtle, the palm, and other leafy trees to make booths as it is written. Okay? 
and then they celebrate it. But if you look down here in verse 17, it says kind of an interesting comment. Uh, and all the assembly of those who had uh, gathered from captivity made booths and lived in the booths. Okay, that's what they're supposed to do. But then look what it says. For from the day of Joshua, the son of Nun, to that day, the people of Israel had not done so. Oops. They had not built booths. They had not kept the feast according to the pattern that was given to them via Moses from God. Okay? But then look at the next verse. And there was a very great rejoicing. And day to day, from the first day to the last day, he read from the book of the law of God. They kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly. Remember that the, the feast is made up of seven days with an appended eighth. Okay? And the appended eighth, um, all of the stuff that happened the previous seven days, you dwelt in the booths for seven days, and, and you celebrated on the eighth day. You, were, you didn't spend it in the booth. You, you actually returned home. And it was a solemn assembly, no ordinary work. Okay? So, they kept the feast seventh days, and on the eighth day there was a solemn assembly according to the rule. Okay, so now... Hold on, try and keep track of these thoughts because we're going to go through some of the customs and traditions that were developed out of this to, to kind of see how this is fulfilled in the New Testament. I'm going to hit these pretty quick. There are dozens, dozens more than what I'm going to give you, okay? Um, I'm trying to keep it brief and concise. Um, so let's take a look at the traditions and the customs and the laws. Uh, regarding the construction of the booth, there were ten rabbinic laws as to how the booth should be constructed. Okay? Drawing out of the writings of, of, the, of the, uh, the law, they came up with these laws. Uh, first, the booth must appear flimsy. The roof especially had to appear temporary. The walls, it didn't matter. You could, you could have walls that were permanent, but, but the roof had to be flimsy. It had to have the appearance of, of weakness. Uh, the roof must come from the earth, meaning that no animal skins or metal could be used. Uh, must no longer be connected to the earth so that you couldn't have living branches. You know, you go to a tree and kind of pull the branches over and tie them together to make a roof. That wouldn't work because it's still connected to the tree that is connected to the earth. Uh, and it must be subject to ritual purity, which means that anything that was bound up in the roof had to last the seven days without going back. Okay? Now keep in mind, these are the rules that the rabbis put in there. Uh, the roof must be put on last so that the booth is complete when it is installed. Well, I don't really know how you put a, a roof on without the walls, but... Evidently, the Jews thought that needed to be addressed. <laughs> okay? The roof must be sufficiently thick that it caused more shade than sunlight. It blocked more of the sun than it, it allowed through. The, there, the gaps that were in it, because you had to have gaps, but they could not exceed 11 inches. Stars must be visible at night through the roof. And the roof can't be so thick that it keeps the rain out. We're having a good time now. <laughs> uh, the shade that is provided must come from the booth and no other source. The walls can be made of anything. It must have at least two walls and must have one open wall, meaning that there would be a door in the wall. If the booth is built against a house or building, uh, the wall can serve, the wall of the house can serve as one or two of the walls for the booth, but not more. And it can't, the house cannot overhang the booth. Okay? You can't use any part of the house for the roof. You see how tedious they're, they're taking this? Okay? Um, the booth must hold at least one person and one table. So it can't be any smaller than 26 by 26. No shorter than 37 inches. And it cannot exceed 36.5 Okay, um, 
The booth can be decorated with art, pictures, etc. The roof may have fruit, but it can't be fruit that will spoil during the seven days. And once you put it on the roof, you can't eat it. It's got to stay there. It's considered a decoration. Okay? Do you, do you see how convoluted and, 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 and mixed up they made this thing? Uh, we'll go forward. I'm just going to hit a couple other things real quick. Uh, we talked about the four species. Um, these are the, the lulav. Uh, they had a citron or a, 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 an orange. Um, it was called an earthog. That was the fruit. And then they had a palm branch and two myrtle branches and three willow branches. And they had to be wrapped appropriately. And in order to do it properly, uh, you had to raise it at certain times and lower it at certain times. And, and they couldn't be stolen. They had to be yours. Okay. So, so no, no stolen branches allowed. Uh, they also, you couldn't borrow them. Okay. So, so whether Benjamin knew I took them or not, they're his. I can't use them. Okay. If I purchase them from him, then, then I can use them because now they're mine and not yours. Okay. So um, a couple real, real quick notes on the symbolism of the lulav. Uh, the palm branch, according to Jewish thinking, each of these represents a particular type of Jew. Uh, the palm branch only came from the date palm, and it has fruit but no fragrance. Okay? This represents the Jew who knows the law but has no good deeds. Okay? Well, then the myrtle has fragrance but no fruit, representing a Jew who has good deeds but is ignorant in the law. All right? Then you have the willow that has neither fragrance nor fruit, and this represents the Jew that has no knowledge of the law and no good deeds. Okay? And then the earthog, or the citron, is a fruit that, that it is a fruit and it has a fragrance, so it represents a Jew who has both knowledge of the law and good deeds. Okay, so each of those is significant to the Jewish way of thinking as representing every part of the Jewish culture. Okay, um, two things that I really want to point out to you as far as the celebration, and then I'm, I'm going to cut this short because um, we're running out of time. Um, Actually, three things. One, Hoshana Rabbah. Does anybody, does that sound familiar to anybody? Yeah. Hosanna, yeah. Hoshana Rabbah. This is the seventh day of the feast. That's what the, the day was called. The seventh day of the feast. And it was a day of celebration, but it was calling God to come and, and deliver them, to, to come and, and heal them, to, to make of them a mighty nation uh, and a people after his own heart. Now, Keep that in mind on the seventh day, the Hoshana Rabbah, okay? Because we're going to see that ties in the New Testament and, and some of the Jewish misunderstanding of the ministry of Jesus, okay? And they would parade around and they would sing Hoshana Rabbah, okay? So uh, keep that thought in mind. Second thing, they would draw water uh, out of uh, the pool of Siloam. There would be a selected set of priests that would go down to the Pool of Siloam, and they would take water in these golden pitchers, and there would be a procession as they went up to the temple. And there were 12 steps between the Court of Israel and the Court of Women, and on each step they would stop and they'd sing one of the, the Psalms of Ascent. And then they'd bring the water up, and they'd go to the, let's see, southwest corner of the altar, and they would pour out water this is where the blood flowed off the animal sacrifices, and they would pour the water each of the seven days to clean out the, 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 the detritus, the, the blood, the offal, okay? Now, this was a moment of celebration, and, and people would sing, and they would dance as if this was coming up. This was an exciting time. And then they do the washing for all seven days. One of the <laughs> other things that they would do was they would light the lights. All throughout the outside of the, the temple courtyards were these big brass... Uh, bowls, and they would put wood in them, and they would light them on fire, uh, and it was said that uh, during the, the Second Temple period, there was nowhere in Jerusalem that you could be that you would not see the light from all of these being lit at the same time, okay? So there was the lighting of the, the light in the temple, okay? Why are those things important? 
because we need to understand those things to fully understand what's going in John chapter 7 and 8. Okay? Um, I'm not going to read. I encourage you guys to look at John chapter 7, 8, and 9. Um, this, this whole thing is set up when Jesus went up to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles. Remember, this, this starts off in, in John chapter 7 with his brothers who did not believe, saying, Oh yeah, come on, we're going up to the feast. Why don't you go with us and teach your teachings there and do your miracles there? You know, come on. Declare yourself to be who you think you are. We all you know, you think you're great. Come on. And Jesus said, no, I'm not going up right now. And so they left and they went, and then a short time later, he came down. Now, now, if you think about that for a minute, Jesus was perfect in everything that he did, meaning that he kept every point of the law. Okay? This feast is one of the uh, feasts that required all the Jewish males to go up to uh, the temple. Okay? And he says, I'm not going. Can you imagine the consternation that must have caused? Here's, here's this man that we're following, and he says he's not going up to the feast. Well, then later he goes up. So... There's two things that I want to draw out for you um, in his going up out of, so go ahead and turn uh, to John chapter 7. I'm actually I'm going to kind of reverse gears here for just a second. There's two things that I really want to point out to you as far as the Jews misunderstanding of the messianic implications of the Feast of Tabernacles. We talked before uh, a little bit about how the Jews believed that the Messiah would come to Jerusalem and declare himself at the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus goes up. He takes Peter, John, James. He goes up on the mountain. He's glorified, um, and then they see that, that um, Moses and Elijah are talking to him, and then Peter says something kind of weird. He says, Master, it's good that we're here. Would you like me? I, I will make three tabernacles, three tents, that, that you might each have one to dwell in. And, and what Peter is thinking here. He's connecting the Jewish understanding that the Messiah will come at the Feast of Tabernacles. And so he's going to build a tabernacle. Well, the date's wrong, but we've got to get the other things right. So he's going to build a tabernacle, one for Moses, one for Jesus, and one for Elijah. Uh, Jesus, you don't, you're not understanding what's going on here yet. Okay? This, I think, it speaks directly to the first advent of Jesus and the second advent of Jesus. When Jesus came the first time, it was the spring feasts. Okay, it was for the Passover, the Paschal Lamb. When he comes the second time, it's going to be for the fall feasts. Okay, so, so Peter misunderstood what was going on, and that's why he was thinking we're going to build tabernacles, because there's that, that idea is so ingrained in the Jewish thinking that the Messiah will come at the Feast of Tabernacles that that would seem to be the logical thing to do. Okay, but Jesus, uh, this is not the time. That, 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 that's not for now. Okay, so... Then there's a, a second thing that really can throw you because um, when Jesus came into Jerusalem, what did the people do? Palm branches. Yeah, what kind of branches? Palm. Palm branches. Okay, what else did they do? Yeah. They sang Hosanna. Hosanna. Those people that were following Jesus believed he was the Messiah. They believed that he was coming into Jerusalem to declare his kingdom. And even though this was Passover, that idea was so knitted into their thinking that they started to celebrate as though it were the Feast of Tabernacles, mm -hmm. the palm branches. Okay? Crying out Hosanna. This is exactly what would go on the seventh day of the Feast of Tabernacles. They would wave the palm branches and, and the other branches with the lulav. And, and then they would march around and they would sing Hoshana Rabbah. I believe that's exactly what's going on as Jesus comes in. 
okay? They, they're thinking this is the Messiah. He's coming to set up his kingdom. It's not going to be long now until the Romans are kicked out. Uh, we're going to get everything established right, just like it was under David, and maybe even under Solomon, and, and everything's going to be good. They were not understanding what his first advent was for, okay? So let's get to, over to chapter 7 of the book of John. Um, I want to draw out just two things really quickly, and then we'll, we'll call this one done. Um, <clears throat> John 7, verses 37 through 39. On the last day of the feast, we know this is the Feast of Tabernacles from earlier in the chapter, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So now, the, the last day of the feast, Jesus stands up, and he says, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me. What do you think was going on? It's the last day of the feast. How are they celebrating? What are they doing? What would make logical sense that Jesus would correlate some action to what he was saying? They were pouring out the water on the altar. And Jesus would look at them and he's saying, I can give you water, that, that, that the living water, that will never need to be replenished. And he's watching as they're pouring water and then he has the audacity to stand up in the middle of the, 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 the celebration and say, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Jesus is making an example of what's going on around so that they will understand the pouring out of the water is not going to do anything for them in eternity. Okay? It's him that they need, not the water. They need the holy water, the, the, the living water, the Holy Spirit that comes from Jesus, sent by Jesus to live in their lives that will refresh and will regenerate and, and re-energize them. Okay, now there's one other passage that I want to, uh, we're going to jump down to uh, chapter 8, verse 12. Now we see from rivers of living water down to where we're at, we're at in uh, chapter 8, uh, a number of things have gone on. They've come to test him with the woman caught in adultery. Um, they, they've challenged him, with the, they, they've examined him, all of these things we know from the, the week of Passover, they're examining the Paschal Lamb to see if he's without blemish, and then in verse 12, Jesus says something, he says, uh, again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life, and then the Pharisees take that and they challenge him, now think about this for a minute, He's at the temple. It's the last day of the feast. What's going on here? He said on the living water when he's watching the water being poured out. What else is one of the, the customs that they would do? They would light the lights. All of the braziers around the courtyard would be lit. And Jesus is looking at them and he's doing the exact same thing as he did with the water. I am the light. This, this, this. This will only work as long as you keep feeding it. You stop feeding it, it's going to go out. But my light will never fade. You see what's going on? Without understanding what was happening during the feast, these things flip right past us, don't they? I mean, he already said he was a living water when he talked to the, the uh, woman at the well, right? So we just go, okay, well, he's just rehashing an old sermon. Well, it worked well the first time, I guess I'll try it again. That's not at all what's going on. Everywhere that Jesus went, he spoke to the people of the area. When he was up in the area of Galilee, he used parables that talked about fishermen. As he came down into Judea and into the, the uh, farmlands, he talked about farmers. And then when he went up into Jerusalem, he talked about masters and slaves. Everywhere he went, he spoke to them according to what was going on in their lives. Why would this be any different? He's at the temple, Feast of Tabernacles is going on, and he's telling them, hey, look, I'm the water. I'm the light. Okay? So, 
those thoughts tying together Jesus is at the again he's he, he did not violate any laws in his life he kept them perfectly even to the point where sometimes the Jews would hey 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 hey, hey. they didn't wash their hands shame 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 and Jesus had to correct him, didn't he? He had to say, now, now why are you following your tech customs and traditions and throwing out the, the matters of the law? And, and he would correct him. So one other thing, how does this all have any bearing on us? What difference does this make to us? Does it make a difference to us? Why should we care about the Feast of Tabernacles? Anybody? It's not a trick question. Revelation chapter 21. It applies to the church of the Gentiles as well. At the end. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, ah, Revelation chapter 21. Everything that is going on, remember first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. And then keep in mind, Jesus said the first will be last and the last will be first. Those that were first given the, the Messiah and they rejected him. Uh, the, the church started with the Jews and then went to the Gentiles and, and things flip-flopped and the Gentiles became the focus and we know that uh, m my belief is at the Feast of Trumpets when the trumpet sounds that will represent the taking away of the church the snatching away of the church and then there will be the Day of Atonement when Israel, the Jews as a nation will acknowledge the Messiah and then the Feast of Tabernacles now look down here in uh, <clears throat> Revelation chapter 21. Okay. Verse 1, I'm going to start there and I'm just going to read down a little bit. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. Now. Does anybody have something different there where it says, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man? Tabernacle. Tabernacle. Mm -hmm. Tabernacle was the original dwelling place of God with man. Now think about this for a moment, okay? When God started creation, he had a plan for the end. Okay? He knew everything that was going to happen. He knew when he set creation in motion what it was going to cost him. Okay? When he created the garden, did God dwell in the garden? Mm -hmm. No. Says he came in the cool of the evening. He didn't dwell there. He just came and visited. Okay. And then when God went through and he, he chose Israel, he chose Abraham out of all the people in Israel to be his own possession. And then he had the tabernacle made and then his presence lived uh, above the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. And then later in the temple in the Holy of Holies, God dwelt with man, but, but nobody could get in to see him except the high priest and him only once a year with the right sacrifice. But when God sets everything straight at the end of all things, when everything has been addressed and all sin has been taken care of and all, all, all has been dealt with, he will make his dwelling place with man. Now, it doesn't say that their tears shall be wiped away. It says he will wipe away every tear. God is going to be in the midst of us. The Feast of Tabernacles is the glorious end to all of the prophetic feasts that God has given in this chapter. And it speaks of something that is coming forth. So they're required to uh, celebrate with joy. Because that's going to be a picture, that's a, a picture, a foreshadow of what's going to happen when the dwelling place of God, when the tabernacle of God is in our midst. There will be joy. Because there will not be any sorrow. There will be no pain. There will be no death. There will be nothing to hinder us from unbridled, pure joy. Amen? Amen. 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 Okay. Um, we have one more feast to cover that is not in this chapter. Uh, as I said at the start, um, there were two other feasts that the Jews celebrated. 
that we see in Scripture aside from these. Uh, we've already covered the Feast of Hanukkah, and then the last one is the, the Feast of Purim. So we'll cover the Feast of Purim in the coming weeks. Uh,